27. When we walk with the Lord in the light of his word. two and three together and then the chorus. sing four and five together. remain standing as we pray for God to bless our tithes and offerings. Amen, amen, amen. Read one verse out of Psalm. Psalm 118, verse 25. Save now, I beseech thee, O Lord, O Lord, I beseech thee, sin now prosperity. Before I knew I was going to do this this morning, I was thinking when I woke up how we should, when we wake up, the first thing we should do is thank the Lord that we're getting to breathe his air again that day. You know, whether he sends prosperity or not, he is everything. And for uh, 20, 26, 27 years now, I've been thanking him, whether it was good or bad. And as the song said trust we need to trust the lord but we don't always obey and one thing that he has in his word is to tithe i mean it, it's bible it's the right thing to do and whether he sends us prosperity or not he wants to give us his blessings with that you, you think of the the lady that gave her one might how he blessed her and she didn't have a lot. So let's thank the Lord for everything that we do have. Let's thank him for our homes, our life, our families. And before you pray, bro, I just want to say that yesterday, Byron and Lisa opened up their home to us as an open house, their new home. It was wonderful to see how God has blessed them as a couple of years of faithfulness. It's not a sin to say, send now prosperity, oh Lord. It's a, you know, just don't pursue the dollar. Man. It's, it's fine, and it's so neat to see that when a couple stays faithful in the long run, how God blesses and cares for them. Yeah, his, 
his mercy uh, it can choke you up <laughs> it, uh, it's good let's thank the Lord for today Heavenly Father we just praise you and thank you for your your love to us and what you do give us and what you do send our way and Lord uh, we just pray that if there's one here that don't know you as their personal Savior as your word says save now today is the day of salvation and Lord uh, I pray that if there's one here that don't know that that they would trust in you with what they have and most of all their eternity their soul Lord I pray they would trust you as their Savior and Lord we thank you for our offering we thank you for all you've done for us and we thank you for today in your name we pray amen and you may be seated and visitors if you would put your visitor card in the offering place it looks like and if you need a king james bible the ushers will be down the aisle with them and you can uh, raise your hand and they'll give you one Fundamental is when the blonde hair swishes back and forth. Uh, charismatic is when it starts standing on end. You know, that's what we, so we, we're, we're keeping an eye on Lauren there. It's getting close. Uh, don't think me poor or deserted or lonely. I'm not discouraged. I am have been bound. And uh, I'm just a pilgrim in search of a city and so on and so forth. So it's more like it was after that. But uh, on the chorus, if you know the chorus, sing it with us. I've got a mansion just over the coming up to the ranks and then Allison and Emily and, and we can't wait for Ben on the ivories man so wow by then you'll be a grandmother working on the first born okay good good all right good good <laughs> amen well I have your Bibles ready I'll give you a scripture in a few moments several years ago in the Petaluma Argus Courier this sad story appeared under the headline, Woman Dies in Crash on Adobe Road. The story read like this. A Sonoma woman died in a two-car crash after she swerved to avoid an animal on Adobe Road. Perla Casillas, age 20, only 20, was driving on Adobe Road near uh, a certain side street, a certain cross street, about 9 o'clock at night, when she apparently spotted an animal on the roadway and swerved to avoid hitting it. Her 1993 Ford Escort crossed the center line and collided with a vehicle in the opposite lane. 
Casillas' car was hit on the driver's side and she died on the scene. The four occupants of the other vehicle escaped with minor injuries. There's no doubt but that none of us, none of us enjoys hitting an animal on the road with a vehicle that we're driving. In fact, it sickens most of us to think that we should be the cause of needlessly injuring or killing an animal. It's a high priority for most of us to avoid hitting an animal. But it is not such a high priority that anyone should endanger himself, other people, his own vehicle, or the property of others in order to spare the life of a small animal. Human life and even human property are still more valuable to rational people than an animal's life. The young woman in this article, whose life was so tragically and pointlessly shortened, attempted to do a good thing, but it was not the best thing. Under other circumstances, it is commendable that that 20-year-old woman would be so conscientious as to exert herself to save an animal from suffering and death. Now we can only shake our heads and pity the waste caused by a poor decision made instantaneously. The resulting accident is a heartbreaking illustration of a misplaced priority. Would you please turn your Bible to John chapter 6? Look at John chapter 6. A few weeks before I first preached this sermon, which I did for our church several years ago, our youngest daughter was driving with her mother when a young cat looked like he was going to run under the car she was driving. My wife immediately recognized what was happening and that Julia was about to make a radical swerve to save the cat. My wife put her hand on Julia's leg and spoke a couple calming words. And yes, the cat did jump into traffic, was hit by our car, and was killed. Everything happened in only a second or two. It is sad that a cat was killed, but it would have been far more tragic if a young woman and her mother had been injured or killed in a vain attempt to save the life of a dumb animal, even if it was somebody's sweet and much-loved pet. A young woman's good intentions were overruled by a mature person's greater wisdom. A higher priority prevailed because youth instantly submitted itself to maturity. On the night I first preached this message, a young man who was visiting our church told of a friend he had had a few years before who was killed at the age of 16 because he yielded to that same impulse to swerve his car to avoid hitting an animal. The motive was noble, but it was a, catastroph a, a, a catastrophic misplaced priority. Such is often the case with misplaced priorities. Let's take a moment to pray. Lord Jesus, speak to us now and help us to see that sometimes a good thing in a given moment is not always the best thing. Sometimes the best thing is a hard thing to do. But the outcome is so much superior to that other decision we could have made but then which results in far more damage and, and pain than would have been incurred if we had done the best thing, as hard as that may seem to be. Lord, please help, especially our young people, to be aware of misplaced priorities and also to learn to listen to the voice of their elders who've already been there, done that, learned from the experience, and that's where they got their wisdom. Pray, God, that you'll please help us all to grow and to more carefully evaluate our choices to see if it indeed be of God or if we're listening to the wrong voice, some, some inner voice that's just our flesh 
wanting a certain outcome or Satan trying to, to get us off path or the world making its demands upon us. Lord, I pray that we'll learn to recognize the voice of God and heed that even when it's a difficult decision, knowing that if we put our choice in your hands, it will always prove in the long run to be the best decision. We thank you, Lord. Please teach us and help us now, I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Notice here in John chapter 6 and verse number 1, after these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias, and a great multitude followed him because they saw his miracles, which he did on them that were diseased. Now, what caused these people to be enamored with Jesus? The miracles. His mir the verse says in verse 2, the miracles, his miracles, which he did. It's interesting that after Jesus was arrested, he was in the custody of the Roman governor, Pilate. And when he heard that Jesus may have, you know, coming from Nazareth, may have been from Herod's jurisdiction, uh, a, a governor of a, of a different province to the north, he was more than happy to get this politi political hot potato out of his hands and pass it to Herod. And Herod initially received Jesus, but it was for an ulterior motive. It's not, it was not for justice sake, nor was it because it's like, oh, wow, I get to meet the Jewish Messiah, and perhaps I can be saved, or maybe he can help me. That was not at all what was in Herod's mind. What we're told in Scripture is this, and when Herod saw Jesus, he was exceeding glad, for, or because, he was desirous to see him of a long season, because he had heard many things of him, and he hoped to have seen some, guess what? Miracle done by him. He wanted Jesus to put on a, a, a stage show, a performance, you know, a, a magic trick. That's what he yearned to see. Is the desire, here's a question I'm asking you, is the desire to, to be the recipient of a miracle or to see a miracle performed, is that a bad reason to spend time with Jesus? I'll hear a yes. Any contrary view? I hear a no. And, 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 and the truth of the matter is, in certain cases, John is right. Yes, it is a bad motive if that is the extent of it. I'm in church because I want to be healed of this physical infirmity, this disease, this, this whatever. I'm, I'm here for, because not only does the man talk about prosperity in a, in a verse from the Bible before we give our tithes and offerings, but I'm here to be blessed. And I, 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 want, I, want, I want God to give me money. And so on that basis, it is wrong. Is, is, it, is that desire wrong? Well, Diane's correct in that, no, it is not. I mean, who here doesn't want to see miracles? I pray for miracles. I want to see miracles. I just don't let the miracles replace my love of the miracle giver. That's the thing, and that's not to become so infatuated with miracles that I lose sight of Jesus, but to be so in love with Jesus, I'd love to see him do a miracle. And I'd love to be the recipient. I'd love some of my loved ones. I'd love some of you. I'd love our church to see miracles happen in our midst, but not in and of themselves. Spiritual maturity will cause you to crave the company of Jesus just because he is Jesus, and not merely because of what he could do for you. Jesus became concerned about the people who were with him here in John chapter 6 and proceeded to miraculously feed about 5,000 of the men who were there with him. The people who craved a miracle became the recipients of a big one that way, so significant that it's one of the few things that is recorded in all four of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Notice in verse 14, verse 14, then those men, when they had seen the miracle that Jesus did, said, this is of a truth, that prophet that should come into the world. This crowd suddenly recognized Jesus to be their Messiah. Just as suddenly it dawned on them that such a leader as Jesus 
could create a worker's paradise in which everything would be provided for the people by their omnipotent, miracle-working king. They would never have to work again. Whether or not Jesus was ready to be their king, they were prepared to force the issue and make him their ruler. I guess this is the birth of Bernie babies way back in the Bible. You'll find everything right back here in the Bible. Verse number 15. Verse 15, when Jesus therefore perceived that they would come and take him by force to make him a king, he departed again into a mountain himself alone. What the people wanted was a good thing, but it was not the right thing for that moment. Now, will Jesus be king? Yes, he will. It's prophesied in the Old Testament. It's promised in the New Testament. It is a certainty. He will rule and reign this world from Jerusalem for a thousand years. He will be king. But this was not the time for it. Other things had a higher priority at this moment. Now, these people, not only did they want a good thing, but it was not the right thing for that moment, it's also true that they did not want the good thing for the right reason. The object was a good one, but the motive was entirely selfish, totally ignoring the will of God and his perfect timing. A good thing done at a bad time becomes a bad thing. Just as surely as a bad thing done in a good time still remains a bad thing. It's also true that a good thing, a good thing gotten in a bad way becomes a bad thing. I mean, what man would not love to give his wife a brand new vehicle of her choice? But if he had to extort money from his employer to get it, then that good thing done a bad way remains a bad thing. It becomes a bad thing. Jesus quietly left the scene, but the people in their selfish desire continued to seek him. Though the people sought for a good thing, in other words, their daily bread provided by the hand of God. And is that not something that, in the, you know, give us, Jesus himself taught, Lord, just come to the Father, say, give us this day our daily bread. That is legitimate. It is a good thing. But they did it with a bad motive, that being, so they wouldn't have to work anymore. They wouldn't have to labor for their own bread. Verse 24, verse 24, please. When the people therefore saw that Jesus was not there, neither his disciples, they also took shipping and came, in other words, they went across the Sea of Tiberias. They came to Capernaum seeking for Jesus. And when they had found him on the other side of the sea, they said unto him, Rabbi, when camest thou hither? It may seem commendable to us that the people sought for Jesus, but the Lord understood their motive for wanting to be near him. Verse 26, Jesus answered and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, ye seek me, not because ye saw the miracles, but because ye did eat of the loaves and were filled. Now isn't it interesting how <laughs> Nicodemus, the night he met Jesus, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher from, come from God, and we've seen the wonderful things that you do, and Jesus says, Nicodemus, you must be born again. He doesn't, we, we bait him, but he doesn't respond. Um, you, you have a situation where, where so often, you know, here, here's, here's Job, and he's, one, he's asking why and wherefore, wherefore, and why do I go through the suffering? When the Lord finally shows up, he deals with all kinds of issues except the why issue. He never does bother. I don't know if to this day if Job knows why, except maybe he's read the Bible now. <laughs> but uh, I don't know if Job, certainly in his lifetime, Job probably never found out the why. He, that just was not an issue with God. And over and over people try to get God, you know, to, to uh, answer a certain thing a certain way. Rabbi, when camest thou hither? Jesus didn't even bother to answer that question. That was immaterial. It was a, it was a waste of, of air. He wasn't interested in pursuing that. Instead, he, he, he nails them for their motive. And then verse 27, he says, 
Labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you. For him hath the God the Father sealed. Apparently there comes a time at which God expects you to move beyond coveting the gifts he can give you and begin to desire to know personally the giver of all good gifts. You need to stop being consumed with what you can get in this life and become enamored with knowing the one with whom you will spend eternity. The one who made it possible for you even to have eternal life. Now my question next for you, the answer in your own heart is, why are you here today? Why are you here today? A few misguided but honest people would admit that they're here for what they can get out of it. They, they crave a certain feeling. Or maybe they're hoping to impress God with their piety so he'll provide them with something they want. They may be afraid of the chastening hand of God. That if they don't come to church, that you know God is going to somehow make it clear he's displeased with them. Perhaps they want to impress the brethren, or at least keep the brethren from talking badly about them behind their backs. Some are here so they can set a good example for their children. They may well become part of that host of American Christians who begin to lose interest in church after their children are raised and gone from home. It could be that they simply want to do their duty. They know it's right to be in church, and so they're here, even though they're not necessarily thrilled about it, and might even wish they were somewhere else doing something else. But why are you here today? Are you here to meet Emmanuel or to feel an emotion? Are you here, are you here for someone called Christ or to get something you covet? Are you here because of your faith or out of fear? Are you here for the Bible or for the sake of the brethren? Are you here because you want the Holy Ghost or simply because you want to raise good kids? Are you here because you want to be or you feel like you're here because you have to be? The crowd who cornered Jesus in Capernaum knew why they were there and Christ knew why they were there. Verse 28, verse 28, then said they unto him, what shall we do that we might work the works of God? Jesus answered and said unto them, this is the work of God that ye, and I'm going to have you read the balance of the verse with me. Let, me. let me start this again. This is very, very profound. You see, they're thinking in terms of, well, if somehow the bread is attached to the work, then what do we have to do to get the bread? It's still about the bread in their minds. And on that basis, they say, what shall we do that we might work the works of God? Verse 29, Jesus answered and said unto them, I'm going to have you read the last part of it in just a moment, so be ready. Verse 29, This is the work of God, that ye, read with me, believe on him whom he hath sent. Can I pause right here and say to our Catholic friends who who just cannot believe that by simple faith you can be saved? And they say, no, it depends on my works, all right? So what is the work that will save you? Believe on him whom he hath sent. It always comes back to believe on Jesus. The Jehovah's Witness knocking on your door because he he wants to try to get into the kingdom and secure his place in the kingdom. You know, he's he's out there doing the works of Jehovah. Well, what would Jehovah have him do? The only work that will secure for him eternal life is believe on him whom he has sent, believe on Jesus. And so it is for the Mormon and Church of Christ and Pentecostal and, and, and the charismatic brethren, all of whom believe you can lose your salvation you got to keep the works, all right? Like what? There's one work that matters. Believe on him whom he hath sent. It's not keeping the Ten Commandments. It's not going to church. It's not taking Lord's Supper or communion. It, it's, you know, those are not the things that matter when it comes to eternal life. The only thing that matters is believe on Jesus. This covetous crowd tried to turn that true, straightforward statement to their own selfish advantage. Verse 30. They said, therefore, unto him, What sign showest thou then that we may see and believe thee? What work 
dust thou. Okay, here we come. Here we come. Watch it. Here it is. It's coming in low and right across the plate. Our fathers did eat manna in the desert. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. And we want to see the same sign from you. We're on the verge of believing in you, Jesus. Oh, yeah. Believe on him who he has sent. Uh, no problem, but give us a sign. The Jew demands a sign. We want a sign. Jesus attempted to reprogram their thinking and redirect their priorities in verse 32. And Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. So it's like, okay, you're, you're thinking I'm a prophet like Moses, but can I tell you something, friends? He's saying, it wasn't Moses that gave you that bread. Moses had nothing to do with it. And they all woke up one morning and there's this white stuff all over the ground. Dropped from heaven and it's edible. They don't know what it is, so they give it this weird name, manna. What does manna mean? I ain't got a clue. It's Hebrew for I ain't got a clue. And uh, so it's like, okay, let's have some. They said it's like angel's food. Man, isn't God good? Not only does he provide, but even beyond bread, he gives us angel food cake. Right there in the desert, you know. And, and so they just all they had to do is six days a week, they'd gather it up. On Friday, they'd gather twice as much. They'd have enough to carry them through the Sabbath and wouldn't have to do any, any effort because it did not show up on the Sabbath day. And it's interesting, God himself took a rest on the Sabbath day, and he expected his people to also. And so uh, it wasn't Moses, though, that did that for them. It, it came from God. God did that for them. He says in verse 33, For the bread of God is he, because remember, at the end of verse 32, he says, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven. He says, we're talking about something here far more profound than the manna. Verse 33, for the bread of God is he. It's not an it. It's a he. It's he which cometh down from heaven. Jesus didn't, you know, that controversy, did Jesus come from Bethlehem or from Nazareth? The best answer is neither. I mean, he was born in Bethlehem, raised in Nazareth, but he came from heaven. And he came down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. Not just a momentary get through another day of living, but you know, sustained nutritionally by, by physical bread, but to be able to have eternal life, be able to exit this world and enter into another world called heaven. Verse 34, Then said they unto him, Lord, evermore give us this what? Do you think they're thinking about heaven? And eternal life and Jesus in a food stamp. No, these people were, were not thinking about spiritual bread. It was their bellies, not their souls, that concerned them. You know, it's interesting. There is a New Testament verse talking to born again Christians that says how God, their, their, their belly is their God. It's all about what I can get, the things I can get out of this life. That's my motivation. That's what moves me. And if God can give it to me, I'll serve the Lord. And if he can't or won't, but the world offers it to me, I'll pursue the world. I'm, I'm, up, I'm, I'm for sale to the highest bidder. I think there's a word for that in the Bible. Well, beyond mercenary, I think it's called spiritual adultery. You are... You are the bride of Christ. You are espoused to your bridegroom. And for you to flirt with the world, because it offers you what you crave, what you desire, fleshly, physically, is to be unfaithful to, or to use a modern phrase, to cheat on your bridegroom, Jesus Christ. You're committing spiritual adultery. With this crowd, the issue always came down to the bread. Physical hunger satisfying bread they sensed that they were on the verge of never having to work again that they were about to win the lottery that their ship was about to come in and they tried to manipulate and pressure Christ into giving them what they wanted they had their own agenda and they were determined to achieve their goal it was just so close he's right there in the person of Jesus he could give them everything they wanted and take care of them forever after. And they weren't about to let this thing go. 
But Jesus came into this world because he loved us, and he wants us to come to him because we love him, not just to get something from him. Verse 35, Jesus said unto them, I am, I am the bread of life. I am the bread of life. This is one of the seven great I am's of the book of John. By the way, that identifies him with Jehovah. Uh, Moses, the burning bush. What is thy name? They're going to ask me, who sent you? Can I know your name? The voice from the burning bush replies, I am that I am. You may tell them, I am hath sent me. The one who is self-sustaining and eternal in and of himself. And in John chapter 8, Jesus, they, they say to him, Abraham knew you? You're not even yet 50 years old. You're trying to say Abraham knew you? Who do you think you are? And Jesus makes a statement, before Abraham was, I am. He connects himself with Jehovah in the Old Testament. And that's, the, there's seven great I am statements in the book of John. Seven, the number of of perfection, the number of, of, of deity. In verse 35 again, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. But I said unto you that ye also have seen me, and believe not. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. For I came down from heaven, not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will which hath sent me, that of all which he hath given me, now Jesus in his mind, he's thinking about what? What's he thinking about here? All which he hath given me. Is he thinking of crowns and glory and nations and power? What's he thinking of? Souls. He's thinking about you. I think on the cross he was thinking about you, not just as a mass of people, but as an individual. And I think at this moment, as only God can do, he's thinking not just of all humanity, or we might say the world, but he's thinking of you. That of all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing, but should, and this should get you cranked up, get your little, your little amen uh, machine going, but should raise it up again at the last day. Ah, we're going to rise again, beloved, through, through Jesus Christ. Verse 40. And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have what? Everlasting life. And I will raise him up at the last day. Jesus offered these people something infinitely more valuable than their daily bread. He wanted to give them what? Everlasting life. Verse 40. Verse 41. The Jews then murmured at him because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. And they said, Is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it then that he saith, I came down from heaven? These Jews were acting like a husband who doesn't love his wife or the person she is inside, but only lusts after the tabernacle that covers her soul. They are behaving like the wife who wants her husband only for his purchasing power. They're like children who are only obedient and respectful to their parents as is necessary to maneuver them into buying things for them. They're like parents who only care that their children make them look good. They're like Christians who only love the Lord and serve the Lord as long as they think they can get something out of it for themselves. Notice that to Jesus, everything in this encounter has to do with him longing to have us with him forever. And for us to love him and want to be with him eternally. Verse number 43. Jesus therefore answered and said unto them, Murmur not among yourselves. No man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me draw him. And I will raise him up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall be all taught of God. Every man, therefore, that hath heard and hath learned of the Father cometh unto me. Now you have to notice carefully what Jesus is revealing in verse 45. The people thought that they had, they had encountered a great prophet like Moses. 
They would even concede that this man might actually be their Messiah. But whom had they actually met on that mountain next to the Sea of Galilee? Because we're told in verse 45, and they shall be all taught of whom? Of God. That's who's doing the teaching to them. That's who's teaching them Beatitudes, and that's who's, 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 who's revealing all these great truths to them. They're being taught of God, not just God through a man, but God who was a man standing before them. This is the one whom they were speaking with now in Capernaum. That same God was standing before them in human form. God in the person of Jesus Christ had come to be their personal teacher, for Jesus declared in verse 45, and they shall be all taught of God. These people were standing in the presence of Jehovah himself. God had come to them personally and was with them. Yet all they could think about was bread. Bread to satiate their physical appetites. You talk about misplaced priorities. There it is right there. The Lord Jesus tried to lift their eyes off the mundane to the magnificent. Verse 47. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. I am that bread of life. Your fathers did eat man in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread that, which cometh down from heaven that a man they may eat thereof and not die. You ought to get happy feet right here. I, I know we may have your funeral or mine but ere long in this auditorium or a funeral home or a graveside service or whatever the, whatever the setting. We may memorialize you or you me, but don't let them fool you. That ain't me in that casket. That ain't you in that urn. That's not you in that dirt and the hole in the ground. That ain't you in that niche in the wall. Man, if you're saved, you've already, you're already gone. And off you're into heaven. That's why I, I know it's a controversy amongst Christian burial versus cremation. And can, can I just say, you know, of all times, for God's people who are normally penny pinchers to get all consumed, I mean, do you want to spend $20,000 for a metal box that everyone ooh and awe about how beautiful it is for two hours and then it's, then it's put away forever? Or a, or a $200 you know, cardboard box where well, everyone will think I'm so cheap. Hey, hey. Say, and you're, you know, <laughs> I, I have a higher purpose for that cash. And I, and I know it's a sensitive subject. And when it's talking about your loved ones, maybe you're somebody, your husband or your wife or your child, your parent. I, I know it's, but I'm just simply saying that if somebody makes a decision different than theirs and they choose to have an elaborate funeral, that praise the Lord. And if they choose to just burn that body into ashes, stick it in a jar or scatter it somewhere to the four winds praise the lord man if the Net neptune society is where it's at and do it on the cheap because it the person ain't there no more i understand it's it's precious to us it's the vessel that housed the soul of someone you love and that's why i have no problem if you want to do something expensive and and and, and more more involved but i also recognize if, if you're okay with hey it's Dad's gone, mom's gone, and, you know, it's, 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 it's not an issue, and we can just do this as inexpensively as possible and, and preserve some of God's money and be good stewards. That's okay, too. That's, so don't let anybody browbeat you one way or the other. Now, I think of that verse. This is where that verse applies so well. Let every man be persuaded in his own mind about these things. But it goes on. What, where, where, we was here somewhere. Okay, so, and they're dead. And, and it says that you may not die. Um, these foolish people were so consumed with their temporal needs and momentary desires that they could not comprehend the significance of what Jesus was offering them. Somehow they couldn't grasp that when your friend is the baker, you're bound to get some bread. But if you alienate the only baker in town, you're not going to get free bread for sure. And what you do get will probably not be his best product offered at the best price. Jesus continued to attempt to reason with these people whom he loved. Verse 52. The Jews therefore strove among themselves saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? 
Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except ye eat the flesh of the Son of God and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I'll raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. And can I pause right there and say, that is not a description of the Mass. That is not communion. That the Lord is, is trying to match their thinking. It's like, if you're all into bread, okay, let's talk about bread. You've got to take in bread for it to, to give you nutrition and sustain your life. You've got to take me in for me to save your soul. You've got to personally receive me as your Savior for me to save you. He's just using this as an illustration, an analogy. He's not, he's not setting up the Mass, which is a mess, by the way, spiritually. Verse 57 as the living Father hath sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. This is that bread which came down from heaven. Not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead. He that eateth of this bread shall live forever. In the end, the people who had followed Jesus from a mountain across a sea to a city left empty-handed, having neither their eternal needs nor their temporal desires fulfilled. Worst of all, they turn their backs on a personal relationship with God. Notice, please, verse 66. Verse 66. Interesting. What chapter are we in in John? What verse? 666. Six, six, the number of Satan. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. That's an Antichrist attitude. I'm a disciple of Christ who turns and walks out the door. I ain't never coming back for whatever reason. They don't like me. My needs aren't fulfilled. They don't appreciate me. I just don't feel loved there. You know, uh, all the excuses, what it comes down to is disciples who turn their back on their Savior and will walk no more with him. They may call it the church, but what it comes down to is they're not walking with Christ any longer. They got neither their bread, nor did they get the baker. And so it is with people who have misplaced priorities. They begin demanding that God give them what they want, even while the Lord offers them what they need. When they can't get God to perform for them, they trade him in like they would a car that no longer looks well or, 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 or appeals to them. They just don't like it anymore, so they get rid of it. They don't usually trade God in for a wicked thing. They simply replace he who is the very best with something that is merely good. They substitute entertainment for God, an experience for God, a relationship for God, a job for God, a house for God, a, their family for God, a sport for God, or a hobby for God. None of these things are necessarily evil except to the degree that they crowd God out of your life. And yet, none of those things will thoroughly, truly satisfy your soul. People with misplaced priorities get neither the bread they crave, nor the God who could have given them bread, and a whole lot more besides. Verse 67, Then said Jesus unto the twelve, Will ye also go away? Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life, and we believe and are sure that thou art that Christ, the Son of the living God. Simon Peter here professed a good profession. So do a lot of Baptists. But then the relatives show up for the weekend, and they have a higher priority than God. When one of the NBA playoffs or one of the World Series games is scheduled for a Wednesday night, that sport is more important than the spirit. And of course, the Super Bowl is always played on Sunday so that Satan can prove which of Christ's disciples are more loyal to him as the God of this world than they are to the creator of all worlds. An unexpected expense or perhaps a family vacation lays claim on their tithes and their pledged offerings. The television offers something enticing to watch late tonight 
or maybe a, a chapter in that novel becomes so engrossing that you just can't put it down, but that causes you to keep hitting the smooth, snooze button the next morning so you don't have time to spend with the Lord in personal devotions. None of these things may be inherently evil. They may, they may even actually be a high priority, in your, high priority in your life. You love basketball. You love baseball. You love football. You love whatever it may be. But they must never become the highest priority. Don't swerve to save the life of a dumb animal only to lose your own. Don't get so fixated on the bread that you alienate the baker. Don't covet the gift so intensely that you offend the giver. You have the chance to get to know God personally. Don't put him off or shut him down. Let him and your relationship with him be at all times your highest priority. Then everything else will fall into its right and proper place of priority. As we bow our heads, please, and close our eyes. Misplaced priorities. Misplaced priorities. If you're here this morning and do not yet have Christ as your personal Savior, we'd love to show you from the Bible how you can know for sure your sins are forgiven and you have a home in heaven when you die. We hope you'll allow us that opportunity. In just a moment, when the pianist plays, I'm going to ask you, if you're willing to step out of your seat, come straight to me and say, Pastor, I, I need to be saved. I'll have someone take a Bible and show you how that can be your free gift this morning. And if you're here already and you say, Pastor, by God's grace, I've been born again. I, I know I'm going to heaven. My sins are forgiven. I've been washed in the blood of the Lamb. But there's a need here I have. I've been so pursuing the bread, I've neglected the baker. I am so enticed with gifts, I've forgotten to honor and worship and love and serve the Creator. And, and, and truly, Pastor, I, I've, I've, got, I've got some misplaced priorities. I'm, I'm, I'm more and more pushing him to the side or pushing him out altogether. Well, I would encourage you then to come and kneel, or if you need to, stand near this platform comes an altar of sacrifice for just a few moments where you can do business with God. We'll sing a song of invitation, and you can pray as long as you want, and return to your seat when you're done, and then join us in singing that, that song. But you do business with God. Let that be your highest priority. Hey, we're just a few weeks away from a time of baptism. If you've been saved and never been biblically baptized, let that need be known. We'd love to schedule that for you coming up. Lord Jesus, thank you for speaking to our hearts. Now, God, please help us. We are all prone to misplaced priorities. It's so easy. We have a spouse that has needs and children that have needs. These young people have, have school demands and uh, friends that, that demand attention and work schedules and projects that become due and, and so many little things. It's ironic how many of the gifts you give us can suck our time away. Lord, the car that needs repair, the yard that needs attention, the, the house that's got to be cleaned. But Lord, I pray that somehow we'll learn to seek first the kingdom of God and your righteousness, allowing all these other things to be added to us in their proper priority. Thank you, Lord. Let's get into the please. Beloved, for just a few minutes, the, the hymn plays in the background. We'll give you a, the song the song number, but the first priority is if you would care to come and kneel and speak to your Lord. If you need Christ as your Savior, come and let that be known. We'd love to have the chance to show you from the Bible how you too can have the assurance of salvation. If you'd be interested, you're welcome to join me as we sing number 313. 313 revive my make it alive again bring it bring it back to where it needs to be Lord 313 
6 o'clock, we have evening service. Now, I understand we've got a lot of teenagers, children, and d adults who just poured themselves out in a week of youth conference, uh, of Bible camp, rather. And this morning, the Lord said, or seemed to say to me, uh, hey, Marathal, <laughs> you know that message you have in mind? That's too long. That's too long. I want you to bring it down to an essence and get these people home. Now, there will be, it will be uh, a lot in this service as far as we want to hear from what happened at junior camp and teen camp, and we want to sing a couple songs. We had a he heaven stock exchange. We, we need something we want to raise money for, and 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 so you know, I'm not trying to say we'll have you out by 6:30, but I will aim for 7:30. Not no promises, but I, I I will I will strive. I'm gonna try to get out as early as I can so you can have some family time and get a good night's rest tonight. You pray, and we'll cross our fingers and see what happens. Brother, pray for us, we'll play. Great message. Thank you, Pastor. Praise the Lord, brother. Uh, that was so good, I think I'll come back to this church. No. But Super Bowl Sunday? <laughs> yeah, okay, I'll come on Super Bowl Sunday, too. Um, tonight, or this afternoon, right after the service, um, uh, five minutes after the service, if you are a member of the church and were not able to participate in the Lord's Supper last, uh, last Sunday, we are going to have a makeup Lord's Supper in the fellowship room. So if you're a member of the church and you need to make up the Lord's Supper, right in the fellowship room, five minutes after the service. Let's, uh, let's have a word of prayer and thank the Lord for the day. Father, we're so thankful for uh, today that we could be here in this place, Father, gathered around your word. We thank you for this message today, Father, helping us to, to, uh, to set our priorities uh, and uh, focus on you, Father. Thank you for that. We thank you for our pastor. Thank you for uh, the, the the safety um, of the uh, of the kids coming back from uh, camp, Father. We thank you for the good time, by all accounts, what uh, what I'm hearing from them, Father. We thank you for that, Father. We ask that you would uh, bring us back safely tonight at six o'clock. We look forward to what you have in store for us. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. And you are dismissed.